Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a Reactor Sydney live stream. Today we are joined with Bryn Lewis, who is going to take us through life beyond the edge. Just a couple of quick things. We will be recording the session today, and we do have a Q&A box to ask Bryn any questions. Um, he'll be taking some throughout, and then we can wrap up and do some more at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Bryn. Thanks, Bryn. Thank you. <sighs> My specialist area is tiny devices. There's been lots of talk about AI on the edge, real-time image processing with jets and nanos to enforce social distancing. You can run processes in Docker containers for aggregating data from devices. It's all very cool. But I spend a lot of time working with devices which have to run for years on a couple of batteries. The processor runs at 8 or 16 megahertz, depending on the battery voltage. And you've got 2K of RAM and 32K of flash. It's even got to the stage where customers select the cellular modem module for the next product based on its baked in support for MQTT. I've been in the industry for a while. 1988 was my last year of university. It was supposed to be a, four, a three year degree, but it took four years because I majored in first year sex and drinking. My career is a lot about learning from failure. I worked in the path lab and I took out the Unisys mainframe, which ran the laboratory management system for four hospitals by dropping a sheet of line flow down the disk pack. I worked in a chocolate factory and it's surprising how fast things go bad at 240 Moro bars a minute when you set the check wire for king size Moro bars when they're making standard size ones. I worked for a gambling company which did in-play sports betting there were huge spikes of traffic when David Beckham twisted his ankle or was sent off. But then things got a bit dicey. The Russian mafia got involved. These days, I work for a fintech company building software for managing large portfolios of financial instruments. We refer to the product as boring maths for accountants or maths for boring accountants. Either way, way works. Based on my earlier career in radio and electronics, I do some integration as a sideline. I also run maker clubs at a local girls' school and work for work with three or four 13, year 13 scholarship students most years doing uh, advanced projects with them. I figured I couldn't use any of my customers' projects, for examples. They want to keep them secret. So I'd use one of my students' projects. My wife's cousin and her husband have spent 20 years establishing a farm. And one Christmas day, we were having a few beers, some are here in New Zealand. Colin asked, could you measure the temperature and humidity in the canopy for blight production, soil moisture levels for irrigation uh, management? And it would be interesting to know uh, how much water they got in their tanks and how much water was actually flowing through their irrigation system. Colin said he had a budget for some sensors, so the project kicked off. Walnut Tree Farm, WTF. The students love it. It's the only time they legitimately get to put WTF in a school document. It's 10 hectares and there are 35 roughly 50 by 50 meter cells. 10 hectares for those hectares for those of you who think in freedom units is about 28 acres roughly. The blight season itself is pretty short. Battery powered units might be necessary as the tree canopy uh, doesn't let enough sunlight through for solar panels to work. Currently soil moisture is measured by one sensor on the farm and Colin indicated that to have a number of sensors would improve water utilisation. Often you can't see uh, blight until it's too late. So with 32 cells, we could trial different spraying strategies to see what worked. It was for a student project, a really interesting application and it actually had some commercial prospects. So my student, She's a year 13 student, and this project was about developing a solution. She learned a lot about engineering. One of the funniest things was remembering to thread the wires through the cable glands before assembly. There was a bit of 
wearing is she then realized she'd have to undo all the connectors through the wires through the cable glands and reassemble it she found that uh ip65 boxes ones which were withstand wind and rain and so forth were mighty expensive electronics doesn't like uh, condensation so on the box with the solar panel on the far right you'll see a little vent this is a hydrostatic vent uh, we spent a bit of time debugging stuff the arduino idea is painful but i do think that platform io or visual micro would have just been overwhelming overall the enclosure just the plastic box and all of the fittings cost about 45 bucks new zealand inside the box there was a a Maduino from a company called Maker Fabs. It was a custom. I had a bunch of them left over from a job I did for a customer. Had a LoRa module, a lot of power control magic, uh, SHT20 temperature and humidity sensor. That's the white thing in the middle. It's a robust design for outdoor usage. And a soil moisture sensor. It's a capacitive soil moisture sensor, and it's one of the few I found that actually survives in the wild. All of the electronics are epoxy blocked and it's too stupid to die. I've got to have a talk to the vendors about the cable they use. It doesn't appear to take lots of UV terribly well. One of the things that the student had to do was calibrate the sensor. We had to um, measure the output and air and then dunk the probe in water and then use that to calibrate the values we were sending back. 100% was just water and zero was in the air. Um, the screw connectors drove her crazy because quite often she put the wire in and do, do the screw up and it would just fall out. Um, next time I'm going to buy more expensive connectors. Back at the farmhouse, we had a Raspberry Pi. This Raspberry Pi had a LoRaWAN shield on the top. That's the one channel LoRaWAN gateway. I was just using it as a LoRa gateway. Uh, it's a piece of software that I've built. And I've got versions for Adafruit IO, for Azure IoT hubs. Um, I've got the same similar sort of stuff for NRF24 wireless and a whole bunch of other MSMQ equipped gateways. Basically takes an ASCII message coming in from a device. We use ASCII rather than any flash encoding plan because it's much easier for students. And then this device uses some C sharp code generated from the swagger that Adafruit provide. Supports a whole bunch of hats, and I've got about two dozen Duino and other embedded processor samples if you ever decide to follow in my footsteps. We used Adafruit IO. What? No Microsoft? Well, Adafruit IO is great. It's just, it just works. You can hitch up clients, there's API keys, there's a free version, which for students is important because there's no way mum or dad's going to let them have the credit card. The free version, the limits don't matter much because students don't have a lot of devices. You know, 60 bucks a pop, your average student ain't going to have a lot. And the paid version, I use that for a couple of other jobs, works really well. The integrations add a bit of value as well. You can schedule tasks, you can get emails when devices have gone offline and when values have gone out of range. You can do some custom processing. You can even send, send commands down to devices, which is good. So the local Walnut Growers Association said there could be some money in this because they'd be quite interested in nurturing it as a project. I thought, oh, cool tried to convince my student that she should do it, make some money of it, out of it, use it to fund her first year at university. But she's doing uh, IP law and computer science is going to be, so she's going to be pretty busy. LoRa connectivity like we used at WTF is great for smaller systems, but to get a courier bag deployable system, I really needed someone else to manage the comms. I didn't want to have to be responsible for putting hardware on a farm. I'm a Microsoft MVP, so, well, Azure was a no-brainer. And I could leverage off all the existing uh, IoT services. I have to write less code, and of course that means there's less of my code to debug. I've used IoT Central, but I'm not certain it would be the right hammer for this particular application. 
So we'll talk a bit about Laura. Laura is not Laura Wan. It's a technology uh, uh, intellectual property owned by a company called Semtech out of France. You can buy the gear from a lot of places. Lots of different vendors have modules. It works in the globally agreed ISM bands, which are of course different around the globe. The terms LoRa and LoRaWAN are often used interchangeably by developers and vendors, which is a pain. You think, oh yeah, it's another LoRa chip or another LoRaWAN chip, but it's not what you're looking for. LoRaWAN is used, just plain old LoRaWAN, is also used for power, water and gas metering applications. So in building present penetration is important. Native LoRaWAN has no addressing or security baked in. Packets are just broadcast and anyone can listen in. I've written low level drivers for this. You use uh, what's called a serial peripheral interface. Uh, you give it a bunch of bytes to send and sometime later it calls you back and says, yep, it's been delivered. For other projects where we're just using native LoRa, I've been looking at open code book, ICB encryption which gives uh, privacy of your data and tamper detection for any addressing information which you attach to the payload. So that's one of my ongoing projects. LoRaWAN builds on top of LoRaWAN that uses LoRa as its physical layer. There are three different classes of devices. There's class A devices which send a message and then see if there's a response waiting for them. So basically turn on, listen and turn off. That's the most aggressive power saving mode. There are class B devices which extend class A. So they turn on, they listen and then they turn off. But on a regular uh, cadence, they wake up and see if there's any messages for them to receive. And then there are class C devices which are online all of the time. LoRaWAN is not designed for low latency streaming video. The target applications send tens of bytes every hour or a couple of times a day. There are global support here in New Zealand. We use AS923 and there's support all around the world in the different frequency bands. There is uh, US 433 and EU 433, which tend to be a bit crowded. People with uh, garage door openers and stuff like that. So you usually end up in the 868 through 915 bands. Some vendors offer pre-baked modules, but there's usually a different part number for each locale. 10 years was the target lifetime for a battery. Best case, you know, that's a simple device and good coverage, sending a message once a day. But you've got to be sensitive to battery chemistry. Some batteries just go flat over time, so you end up with uh, weird battery chemistries that you wouldn't normally use in your camera or your laptop. You sort of expect somewhere between 5 and 15k range. It depends a lot on where your devices are mounted, how tall your antenna is, how much gain your antenna's got, and the nature of the structure of the buildings. Here in New Zealand, we've got a lot of wood frame buildings, so you tend to get really good in, how, in building penetration. The security was baked in from the beginning, they thought about it. The devices or the device and the network authenticate each other and then um, the, the data stream is encrypted both at the application and the network level. So the network can't see what you're sending and so forth. It uses AES 128 CTR and the CTR bit is important because you can actually send messages uh, without any conf confirmations and uh, CTR means that if you miss a, mes miss a message you can uh, decrypt it and keep on going. The expectation is that there will be minutes between messages and some networks will hell ban you if you send messages too often. Expect about 250 bits a second through 11 kilobits. I have never had 11 kilobits. You know, I've got devices. Expect slow. The devices uh, can also be located by the network. When you get a message from the network, the HTTP integration I use, you also get the positions of the, the uh, LoRaWAN base stations which received it, so you can do a sort of basic form of triangulation. There are a couple of Lor nationwide LoRaWAN, uh, uh, global LoRaWAN networks. There's the Things Network, which is uh, 
a community driven open source effort, then the things industry, which is the money making version. In New Zealand, there are two networks and in Australia, there are another two networks. It's pretty cheap. These prices are Kiwi dollars. So you know, my expectation is if the business got bigly, I'd be spending 125 bucks per month. You'll see on the right, there's a coverage map for Spark New Zealand's network. You can see uh, there's areas where there's no coverage, but Spark can provide a box to give you, or they, they will lease you a box to give additional coverage in your locale if you're outside the standard regions. Uh, the cost, the, the money per device is pretty low, so they're really focused on automated provision and device self-managing. There's even an open source uh, version available from Microsoft, which uses a, a IoT Edge device and uh, Semtech packet forwarders. The prices are usually a lot less than uh, cellular because they expect the devices, uh, the network infrastructure is cheaper to deploy and operate. So measuring stuff in the trees. I don't know how good this will look. That's one of these. This device is, oh, you can see I've got average size hands. Uh, it's designed for monitoring buildings, but we figure that if we were building this commercially, we'd build a bracket to go on it so that we could hang it in the trees. It supports all of the global bands and the battery should last for about two years if we're sending the position every 30 minutes. We need to send it roughly every 30 minutes because it's surprising how fast the temperature in the tree canopy can change. The QR code on the top is so that you can provision devices in the field or take ownership of them. So you can ship the devices out and then when a customer wants to put them on the network, you can uh, just scan the QR code into a custom application on their phone. And they're pretty cheap. They're 30 bucks US, which is about 44 Kiwi. One of the things that they provide online is a battery life calculator. So you can calculate, um, feed in some numbers about how often you want to send, position, uh, send data, the size of the data, and what the coverage is like, and it will give you an estimated battery life. One of the other things that Colin was interested in was monitoring the soil moisture. This is a sort of device, maybe I'd use a solar panel powered one because this won't be in the canopy of the trees. This one's got a capacitive sensor rather than a conductivity based sensor. So hopefully the uh, readings won't change over time. You can see that the sleep current's pretty good. That's uh, 20 microamps. But when it's transmitting, it can get to sort of 120 or 150 milliamps, which if you transmit too often would chew through the batteries. With this one, you've got a USB port and an Android application for tweaking the settings. These are about just under a hundred bucks Kiwi, which is starting to get up there. Colin was also interested in monitoring the water flow. So we were going to slice in some pulse counter sensors into the pipes. Uh, this device is in a weatherproof box and you, there are versions available which have one and two uh, pulse counting inputs. We were sort of planning on maybe a wee bit more than 24 messages a day because sometimes the sprinklers are only on in a paddock for a half an hour. And we weren't going to be able to put too many of these in because they were sort of 170 bucks Kiwi. They're pretty robust, but I do wonder about the ceiling around the LED on the top. So we might have to put them inside another closure, enclosure or uh, with a weather shield on top. There's a pump shed. The uh, pump shed, People have sneaked into it. These are, uh, where is it? This is the actual device. And you can see it's powered by a, a small CR2032 battery. They reckon that these are good for a year. I do wonder though. They quote the um, battery life and the number of packets sent and received. It sends a packet every day. And these Draguino devices, you tend to program them with Haze AT commands, which is pretty state of the art. These would be good for a, um, say like a building monitoring application, doing uh, office utilization and things like that. 
once the walnuts are picked and dried, they need uh, Colin's got a couple of uh, repurposed shipping containers where the walnuts are left to do their final drying. He needs to make sure that they are in the optimal range for drying, which is pretty loose, but if uh, the container leaks or there's a couple of cold mornings, it can become problematic. And this is the sort of sensor you could hang on the walls inside the container. They have pretty good battery life. And again, it's Hayes AT commands to set the parameters. I think he's got three or four containers, so it's sort of just over 200 bucks US to monitor all the containers. Again, these could be turned off uh, during the deep winter because there's no um, walnuts being dried. There's a couple of tractors and mowers, so we want to track those to see what they're up to. That's the box there. I've got a, this one's being dismantled because I was using it for another application. This should effectively run indefinitely with a solar panel. The, um, just got to be careful with the power conservation and power management features of the GPS, so the GPS spends most of its time asleep. Um, these would be really good for some sort of large scale asset tracking applications, say diggers or trucks or containers. And it can be configured, this one can be configured to send positions less frequently when the, the, the vehicle isn't moving. These are about 80, 80 odd bucks a pop. Um, this is, I guess, intended for lone worker applications. You can even get it with a belt clip to, um, so you don't have to uh, mount it on anything. There's been some chat in the RAC forums about uh, using the accelerometer and gyro for fall and movement detection, which would be pretty useful. It sends uh, latitude, longitude, altitude based on uh, and barometric pressure, which is really good for altitude as well, uh, gyro and acceleration data, which um, they provide unpackers for and so forth. For testing and debugging at home, I use one of these uh, gateways. It runs a version of Linux and for 180 bucks Kiwi, it's a pretty good solution. It sits on the end of my desk. I've got a GPS unit on the windowsill and a um, for a bigger system, this is the sort of antenna I'd use. It's a big dipole antenna. It gives me plenty of range. I'm looking at doing some testing with that on one of the schools I teach at. They've got a three-story building in the middle of the campus, which would be good for a range test. If Collins Farm, there were coverage problems at the end, a gate like this would be the deal. We could stack, put that on top of a post on top of the um, barn and get really good range. These are also intended for commercial applications. Uh, they've got 4G backhaul in Collins case. We just use power over Ethernet. And for a commercial application, they'd run them via a cellular network and there's five hours battery for improved reliability and so forth. If, if you're running it standalone, there's a built-in LoRa server which lets you hang 128 devices off it. It's uh, IP67 rated, so it can withstand weather and driving rain and so forth. There are also other rec, uh, gateways, other gateway products designed for um, indoors use. So if you are equipping a smart building, you could put a couple of these uh, indoor gateways uh, around. The, uh, there was an interesting discussion about this company instrumenting a 24 story building and the number of um, gateways they needed to install to get good penetration into the core and the shafts and things like that. I'm a lazy programmer. I don't like writing code. So I wanted to get some data out of the Things Network back into Azure IoT Hubs and Azure IoT Central. I use the plumbing. I've got IoT Hubs. I've got DPS. I can monitor it with uh, application insights. I've got storage queues to glue the bits together to give me fault tolerance and scale. And Azure Functions are a neat way of giving myself scale and support for advanced functionality. Some of the keys and so forth, are, I want to keep them private, so I store everything in Key Vault. Number of jobs I've been on where I've got people who've tried to build their own IoT hub, it's hard work. And they usually don't realize how hard it is until they've made a hash of it. 
In my implementation, I'm doing device to cloud messages and I'm planning on cloud to device messaging. Azure IT Hubs gives you message routing and integration with a whole bunch of Microsoft um, magic. And from 10 bucks a month as a starting point and effectively infinite scale, it's a mighty good tool to use for that. You'll see in the graph on the right, it was some stress testing I was doing, 2000 devices sending 48K messages. To get the uh, things network and Azure to play nice, I used a HTTP integration. I did think about using an MQTT integration, but HTTP seemed a lot easier. I provision the devices on the on demand. So the first time a device arrives, I call DPS and get back the connection string. I then also offer some mapping capabilities so that you can map uh, the Azure IoT Hub you connect on based on the application ID that comes from the Things Network or the port number. So you might have a device which uses port number one for telemetry data and port number two for G. PS data. After a bit of consideration, I actually got rid of a lot of the retry code. I pushed that all back into the Azure function. So if anything fails, I just throw an exception that goes back into the Azure storage queue and then comes back at me after a couple of minutes to try again. I get stuff into Azure IoT Central. It's a CS IoT package, so of course it's not going to be as cool as something you built yourself. Templates, devices, and device groups do my head in sometimes. And also the format of the JSON payloads for GPS locations. Azure IoT Central uses LAT, LONG, and ALT, ALT, ALT. Um, Cayenne low power packets and quite a lot of other programs use latitude, longitude, and altitude. So there's a bit of fudging goes on under the covers. It does feel like a bit of a work in progress. You can see new functionality coming out. And I had some earlier V2 applications, which I haven't been able to upgrade, which is painful. It's also got freedom format dates. And that's something that really winds me up. MMDDYY. It's painful. It's got a lot cheaper since the first time I started out with it. And for certain applications, I reckon it would be a great hammer. So where does .NET on devices fit? A long time ago, I used to build software with Windows CE. I built applications for Compaq IPACs. And that's an XDA phone on the right. The device on the top, right as a watch that was one of microsoft's products based on the dotnet framework that was pretty cool they used broadcast radio to receive weather and sports data and stuff like that and that effectively morphed into the dotnet micro framework which a few years ago microsoft open sourced it was more of a take it and lob it over the wall and see what happens and the build process was pretty painful i had maybe a dozen goes at building it before I finally got it to work. There was also the Compact Framework, which is a really cut back version of the .NET Framework, which uh, basically lots of overloads were missing. So you'd go dot and there'd be only one or two um, overloads rather than the say five or 10, but it worked really well. And now more recently, there's been Windows 10 IoT Core, which I invested a lot of time and effort learning, but now appears to be particularly on the Raspberry Pi um, limited availability. I do have some IMX boards and a few others which I'm working on for customers. So hopefully it will continue that way. Out of the smoldering wreckage of the .NET framework came the .NET Nano framework. It's open source. You can contribute. There are even people from Microsoft putting in patches. It's great. The people who build it are a nice bunch of people. They've got some quite active Discord chat groups and they they really are quite good. I've been onto some forums. The Arduino one would be a classic example. There are some people who are not very nice to 
newbies and there are some serious assholes the way they deal with people asking questions but nano nano framework really good they got a whole bunch of target boards my two faves are the net 203 and the esp32 so with the esp32 that's the one that every one's been talking about that device on the bottom right is a, a stm discovery 679 with a, a rack wireless LoRaWAN card on top trap for young players you've got to have both cables plugged in in the last week or so the dotnet nano framework has joined the dotnet framework which is cool it's got some limitations but it's nice to work with and the visual studio integration is pretty good even though it sometimes won't let go of serial ports and causes my Arduino IDE to spit the dummy. A more recent entry into the marketplace is the Wilderness Labs Meadow. Much like the narrow framework, they're a nice bunch of people. It's got a fair bit more go and it runs .NET standard. You've got some extra flash, plenty of RAM, and it's in it. Adafruit form factor, which is cool, but I've struggled to get a variety of uh, like NRF24, LoRaWAN, RFM69, and uh, other wireless cards for it. It's got a secure boot, which is cool, effectively an entry level TPM, and the LiPo charger makes it easy to use for solar applications. It's been a while gestating. I think they misunderestimated, to use a George Bush's, Bushism, the amount of effort required to uh, get .NET standard going on the device. Brian, who's I guess the CEO, he used to work on the Xamarin project at Microsoft. So it, it's a quite a modern implementation and it doesn't carry a lot of baggage. The other option is the uh, GHI, Electronics Tiny CLR. It's really quite a polished offering. They date all the way back from when uh, the .NET micro framework was being used by the Microsoft Research Labs in Cambridge in the UK to let them prototype um, small device applications. Gus is a Gus who owns the company. It's nice to be able to talk to the CEO. I'm guessing GHI is his initials. They're really designed for integration into commercial products. The product on the top left is a SOM, a system on a module. You can basically buy that, plug it into a, a edge connector inside your device and you're away. I tend to use the uh, device on the right, which is the Fez portal and the uh, Arduino and the Fez feather. Uh, my wife has been having a play with the Fez bit. There's a whole bunch of device management capability meant for uh, preparing these devices in large numbers for shipping. In the background, it's got libraries provided for hitching up to Azure and AWS and other SaaS IoT packages. When you build software with it, you use a series of NuGet packages, so you only have to bring in the absolute minimum of support libraries to build your app. So if you don't want to do text, you can leave out system.txt. You can also get at some of the native APIs, and it's got a bit more functionality than, say, the Nano Framework. You've got um, some advanced collection support, and you've even got reflection if you really, really want to do it. So, making this work in a wireless world, I built a bunch of libraries to let you do stuff. On the top right, you'll see a Spark ESP32 running the Nano Framework. It's a single channel LoRaWAN gateway, which I configured to talk LoRa and Nano Framework. In the middle is a, a meadow with a Adafruit um, RFM 96, 95 uh, feather doing um, 915 megahertz LoRa. And at the very bottom is a uh, Dragino shield running on top of a Fez Duino from Tiny uh, from GHI. I've done libraries for the Nano Framework, Meadow, Tiny CLR, and Windows 10 Core. There are versions for uh, LoRa, NRF24, and I've done a couple of LoRaWAN libraries. 
There's also a crowd in the US called Casco Logic, which provide a microbus. Um, I should have found one of those uh, card, which is great for some of the STM test boards and some of the larger um, tiny CLR mod, uh, boards. Over the last month or so, I built a library for the Rack Wireless chipset. I've got versions for the Nano Framework, Tiny CLR, and Windows 10 IoT Core. They ship a bunch of breakout boards, which you can connect with jumper leads, and I've been trialing with the um, the Wizduino board, they call it. You have to invalidate the warranty to make it work. In a blog post, I did detail the uh, three resistors, three zero ohm resistors that you need to take a pair of wire cutters to. You've got to make sure that there are a small pair of wire cutters because you've got to fit down between uh, the edge connector and some those pins. I'm looking at doing a version for the microchip LoRaWAN modules, but the problem is they don't support, well they do support AS923 which is used in New Zealand, but I can't seem to find a binary for it. And there's a German crowd called IMST which I'm trying to source some modules to have a play with. There's a vendor, one vendor who does microbus modules, so I'm trying to source some of those, but the problem is the minimum purchase unit is 10 or 20 and I only need one or two. And then uh, an individual unit might be 40 bucks, but the freight will be $40 as well. So you end up paying the thick end of 80 bucks for a single device, which um, my finance committee won't approve. As part of the associated plumbing, I built a um, Kyan L power, uh, low power protocol encoder. This takes uh, messages, temperature, humidity, GPS, accelerometer, gyro readings, and packs them up in a small format. You've got to basically shrink the amount of data that you send to increase the number of devices and save power, because the shorter your messages are, the shorter that you've got to keep the transmitter on. There's native support for it in the Things Network, and if you have any special requirements, for example, with the Things Network, you can plug in uh, JavaScript-based encoders and decoders. Some of the vendors uh, for the like for the rack tracker which goes in here they provide the javascript to unpack their messages and present them nicely there's also some additional data types which aren't supported uh, by the things network they were like version 1.2 or something there are some slight issues though you can see on the screen on the right that's a gps receiver which is sitting on my windowsill and it jumps from node to node because the values are truncated. That device hasn't basically moved for the last week and it just snaps from node to node to node because the last couple of decimal places have got knocked off the payload. So this technology has got to be fun. That's my longboard. I'm epileptic and not allowed to drive right now. I've got to have no seizures for a year and they're still messing with my drugs so it's going to be at least 18 months before I can drive again. And then I might not want to drive again because I'd hate to be responsible for hurting or injuring anyone else. So I use this longboard in summer. It's got a single motor and it's based on the uh, electronics and so forth from a eighth scale radio control monster truck. That is a lunchbox and it's attached to the long board with 3M command adhesives. I had a learning experience. You've got to use the proper 3M command adhesives, not the ones designed to attach uh, things removably. Uh, they've got Velcro in them because Velcro is designed to resist horizontal movement and not vertical movement. I jumped on the long board on the street outside to test it and the battery pack and the lunchbox fell off. You can control it with a, a OEM WeChat, and it's great. It's priceless. The, seeing the look on teenagers' faces who are biking or skateboarding when they're overtaken by a middle-aged balding guy is just priceless. The next version is going to have two motors. Currently, it's only got one motor, and it's going to have uh, traction control and ABS. It's quite exciting if it's a bit cold or a bit damp when you 
put on the brakes and one wheel locks up. It's got more than enough acceleration and more than enough braking to throw you off. So I'm going to have to play around with throttle mappings and so forth in, a, in the next version. Uh, two motor versions will do sort of 40, 45 kilometers an hour flat out. And yet there's even people who've done quad motor versions, which do 80 case, but that just strikes me as an accident waiting to happen. Um, how are we doing for time? We've got about 20 minutes left. Cool. So this is where I entered demo hell. Um, first, I figured I'd show you uh, this is a rack wireless module running on top of a GHI electronics Festuino. So we'll download some code and get that going. Um, uh, here we go. I've wound up the font, so hopefully you can see it. So now if I deploy the code to the device, uh, I've wound down the time so that you can see messages being sent uh, much faster. You might have heard the wee bing bonk, that's the device rebooting. It does deltas on the binaries which are sent, or the, the device equivalent of LDASM. Uh, and now it's sending. Uh, there are two different forms of uh, LoRaWAN connecting to the network. There's OTAA over the air um, activation, which is designed for bulk deployments. And then there's ABP, which is application uh, activation by personalization. One of the things you can do with LoRaWAN is send unconfirmed messages. So if you're sending 10 messages a day and you really only care, or 12 messages a day, and you really only care about the end of the day value, but it might be useful to get some values during the day, you can send them unconfirmed. And you can see that in the Things Network. It's much easier on power as well. So normally this would be sending data every, um, say, 10 to 15 minutes. Currently it's sending every 10 seconds. And I should really stop it before I get in trouble with the network operator. So that's a rack wireless chip running on top of a, uh, hopefully everyone can see that, running on top of a rack wireless device. Um, then, um, Nadia, was that okay? Could people see it? No, that didn't come across. Okay. Yeah. Dang. <laughs> um, we'll just try sharing the screen a different way. Sure. So here we go. How's this one? Can people see that? Yep, that's come across. Uh, this is a Netduino client. It's running the .NET Nano framework and it's using a Draguino card. Uh, this is the device here. I'll just download some code to it and fire it up. It's now, ah, oh, oh, that's me being stupid. Device Explorer. The uh, software gets a bit whiny and doesn't default to ports, so we'll now download it. So uh, this is communicating with a field gateway that hopefully you can see the green light flashing over my shoulder. That's actually the GPS saying it's got a lot. So it's now sending packets every so often, and it's sending the temperature and humidity of my office. So if we now flip to uh, one of the other applications I'm running on my desktop. This is uh, Azure. Oops. Uh, Azure IoT Explorer. And if I fire this up, you should be able to see this one's coming in via the Azure Field Gateway. And I'm running the Azure 915 megahertz client. I can now see the telemetry and I'll start it. 
So the Netduino is sending data. Oh, there we go. Every so often. It's interesting watching the students look at the device address in BCD and they go, oh, what's that? And then they sit down with an ASCII table and draw it. You can see that every packet you get the signal to noise ratio, the receive signal strength indication and the RSSI. Looks like we've still got 10 minutes to go, so I might try again with the uh, rack wireless demo. I should have set my device up, my desktop up to use the um, screen I'm currently working on. So we'll shut down that project and fire up the rack gateway. So that one there. So this is the rack gateway. Hopefully this time it's working. I'm downloading the assemblies. I'm using a BMP 180 temperature uh, barometer sensor. It's downloading the binaries. And I can most probably flip to Azure IoT Central. Have a look. Okay. So I've got Azure IoT Central fired up. Azure IoT Central is pretty good. It does, sometimes it frustrates me. You'll see that I'm plotting my location. Oh, you now know where I live. And those are the temperatures and humidity of different rooms around my house. Very light blue line is the temperature and sensor, uh, temperature and humidity sensor in my garage, and the, those vary wildly depending on whether it's getting sun or not. Well, it's 10 minutes to go. Does anyone have any questions? I guess. Uh, chat. I can't see any chat. Show Q&A, here we go. Published. As you are, IT Central. Uh, personal tips for becoming an IT developer. Learn a bit about uh, electronics. You'll end up reading circuit diagrams and stuff like that. Learn a bit about power conservation because um, that's important. You'll spend a lot of time managing power and ensuring that uh, you're getting the maximum battery life possible. Uh, the other tech guy, Agent Smith, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah. So um, if you've got any further questions, drop me an email, follow me on Twitter, have a look at the GitHub projects. Um, is there anything else to add, Nadia? Um, no, but we'll give some people some time to ask any questions if they have any. Um, I might just go through a quick update with everyone with a few of the events that we do have up and coming. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. If you do want to see the other events that the Reactor do have up and coming, you can visit us on our Meetup page at meetup.com slash Microsoft Reactor Sydney. You can also follow us on Twitter as well. And we have a lot of the sessions that we run uploaded to our YouTube channel. So I can pop that link in the description for everybody. Um, and if you do have any questions about the Microsoft Reactor or you're pretty keen to get involved in a live stream, feel free to email us at reactors at microsoft.com. I've popped this link in the Q&A box. Um, so if you've got any feedback for the session or you'd like to go more in depth, um, with a couple of the products that Bryn did mention. Please let us know and I can chat to Bryn about that. He volunteered himself to go <laughs> more in depth. Yeah. Um, and I've also got just a couple of the events that are coming up next week. So for the person who asked about, you know, what are some of the personal tips for becoming an IoT developer? Well, we've got a session next week about some key questions to ask yourself before developing your IoT solution. So that might be a pretty cool session for you to join as well. 
Um, we then have another one around ethical challenges of using facial recognition systems. So we're gonna have one of our Microsoft employees come and share a few of the, the learns that we've had and some challenges, and we'll do some real world examples with that one as well. So using our Windows Hello and some insight from our Face API teams here at Microsoft. We've also kicked off a new series. So this is going to start on Saturday, 17th of October. So these are all based in Australia time zones. Um, it's called the APAC Power Apps for Big Kids and Little Kids. So um, this session is going to be the first one held here in the APAC region. And it's just to get kids introduced to Power Apps and what you can do with it. And we've also got some more information on our Meetup page where parents can sign up to get a free trial of the E3 subscription. So your kids will have access to Power Apps and be able to follow along on the 17th as well. Um, I haven't seen any more questions come through, so I think we're all good. Was there anything else from you, Brett? Um, someone asked, what has been the Munich project? Oh, yeah. this. It's a LoRaWAN <laughs> GPS tracker and it's a business enterprise project and the students wanted to track elderly people who had legged it from old people's homes. Um, that was one of the projects. And then uh, I've got another one over here. This is a water bottle rocket. So uh, the fins clip on there. It's basically designed to fall apart when it hits the ground, but it's got a telemetry pack which goes inside a funnel which sits on top. And you can see there's the cap on the end of the telemetry pack. So the students are sending data from the water bottle rocket back to a base station and getting acceleration. And um, as the water bottle lifts off the pad and then uh, deceleration values as it smacks into the ground, that uses a uh, NRF24 device, which is pretty small. There's basically, this is device here, runs off a couple of AA batteries, and they're sort of 20 bucks a pop, which is good because I've wrecked a few when they've hit the ground. Um, yeah, if anyone's got any other questions, um, feel free to contact me via Twitter or some ooh. other. Someone is just coming with a question from Rob. Is there anywhere I can view a list of those devices? Uh, the ones that I was talking about. Which devices? Um, oh, the, uh, the temperature sensors and so forth. Um, two of the big vendors. If you're in Australia, there's the IoT uh, store.com, which I think is in Perth. And they resell a whole bunch of vendors gear. The Rack Wireless site's pretty good. They've got a bunch of sensors like this one and the um, GPS trackers. Uh, Draguino do these pendant devices and uh, the door open close sensors. There's a lot of devices out there. The main thing is certification. Here in New Zealand, we run AS923. And it's often hard to get devices that do that, depending on where you are in the world. It may be easier or harder to get devices. For example, India and Korea run quite unique spectrum allocations. Um, where else would I go for devices? Uh, there's a website called Tindi, T-I-N-D-I-E. In a school environment, you've got to be real careful that you spell that properly. On there, there's lots of people selling LoRa and LoRa WAN devices. Some of the LoRaWAN devices, you need to use the LMIC stack. That can be a bit problematic, particularly if you want AS923 coverage. Um, also, the LMIC stack, there are so many different forks of it. You've got to make sure that you get the right fork. Um, problem with that sort of stuff is you need to, if you're going to do professional or commercial grade applications, you need to get the devices certified. And here in New Zealand, that's about 10 grand a pop. So you've got to be building an awful lot of them to make it worthwhile. Otherwise, just use a pre-baked module. Uh, any more questions, Nadia? Awesome. No, I don't think we've had any more come in. I did put the link to that Tindy website as well, if anyone wants to go and check that out. 
you've <laughs> really got to write that on the whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> so I made sure I, uh, I put that one in there for everybody. I checked the website. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is, is there any, any questions? I did pop uh, Bryn's Twitter handle in there as well for you guys to jump on and follow him or if you've got any more questions to him as well. Um, so other than that, I just want to thank everyone for joining us from wherever you are. Um, and thank you again, Brenda, for jumping on and taking us through Life Beyond the Edge. So we're looking forward to, to hearing more from you. If anyone wants to do a specialised presentation where I can drill down into excruciating detail, just contact Nat here and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, just let me know. I'll pop my LinkedIn information in there for everyone as well. And like I said, Bryn volunteered himself for this. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you, Bryn. And we'll speak to you all soon. Bye for now. Thanks very much.